Hello and welcome to today's program, The Impact of the U.S. Midterms and the U.S.-Korea Alliance. Um, my name is Tom Byrne, and I'm the president and CEO of the Korea Society. We are proud to present the 2022 uh, Korea Society Van Fleet Policy signer, Signature Event in partnership with the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress, the FMC, and the Congressional Study Groups. Uh, for this program, we are delighted to be joined by a bipartisan pair of former members of Congress, uh, former Representative Russ Carnahan, um, and a board member of the former members of Congress, and former Representative Ted Yoho, uh, a sustaining member of the FMC. The Honorable Russ Carnahan, a former Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, most recently uh, was a prominent leader for the 2020 Biden campaign where he served as an outside advisor. From, from, 20, from 2005 to 2013, uh, Russ represented Missouri's third congressional district, which I understand is around St. Louis. Um, he served in several leadership roles, including as a senior Democratic whip from 2009 to 2013 and co-chair of the bipartisan center IL caucus focus on common sense solutions for both political parties. Russ was selected as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations and received a presidential appointment from the Obama administration as congressional delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Russ. And if you don't mind, uh, I also understand you're on the board of the former members of Congress. Would you like to say? a couple of words about the former members of Congress. I am, and uh, it's great to be with you all. And just on behalf of the former members of Congress, uh, the organization, uh, and in particular the study group on Korea, uh, they're based in Washington. Uh, the study group on Korea was formed in 2018 uh, and is housed at the FMC. The former members uh, just celebrated their 50th anniversary uh, this year, but the Korea Society has been a, a key partner uh, for the study groups since they were founded. Uh, the study group now is co-chaired by Representative Ami Berra of California, Democrat of California and Representative Young Kim, Republican of California. Uh, and on the Senate side, uh, chaired by uh, Senator Brian Schatz, Democrat of Hawaii and Senator Dan Sullivan, Republican of Alaska. So we've got uh, some great leadership uh, in the study group and thank you all for, for being a part of that. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, our next uh, uh, guest speaker is the Honorable Ted Yoho. Uh, Congressman Ted Yoho is a senior advisor to the Kyle House Group, a consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. After serving as a Republican in the House of Representatives for eight years, representing the 3rd Congressional District of Florida, which I understand is in North Central Florida. Correct. Uh, Ted first entered Congress in 2013 as a member of the 113th. Congress. He served on the Agricultural and Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, in the 115th Congress, Ted became the chairman of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee. Uh, Ted and his team led the passage of the BUILD Act, um, that's B-U-I-L-D, which means better utilization of investments uh, leading to development act. These All these acts are very cleverly uh, acronymed. Um, authorized and creation of the United States International Development Finance Corporation. So updating our um, the, the official uh, U.S. government um, investment and aid uh, uh, program for developing countries. Uh, this is the largest for, uh, reform to foreign aid in decades. Thank you for joining us, yes, sir. Uh, Ted. Look forward to it. Good. Um, so... Uh, during today's timely conversation, we will hear insights on the impact of America's midterm elections on the country at large and on uh, the dynamic relationship with South Korea. Uh, this roundtable dialogue, which we're trying for the first time here at the Korea Society, uh, will feature um, dialogue between the former representatives and a group of policy and corporate professionals uh, who have joined us here today. Um, and I'd like to give a special uh, welcome to a surprise. Uh, guest, uh, Minister, former Minister uh, Yohan Gu, who served as a re the Republic of Korea's Trade Minister from 2021 uh, to 2022. So welcome, um, Minister Yohan. 
We are excited to hear your perspective and benefit from your expertise. Today's conversation will be released as a pre-recorded video uh, and podcast to a wide audience. Uh, we're proud to collaborate with the former members of Congress on this program and on the Congressional Study Group on Korea. And I'd like to, um, and uh, so Freddie Russ gave the introduction to the FMC. Um, so I'll kick off with a, a question or two and then uh, we'll see how things go and, and feel free to uh, answer follow, uh, ask follow-up questions. Uh, as we look forward to the start of the 118th Congress uh, on, January, uh, on January 3rd, 2023, can you tell us what are the main takeaways of the past midterm elections? Um, how will the new Republican-held House and the continuation of a Democratic-held Senate affect the US political and economic environment of the course of the next year or two? Um, what do you think will be the top legislative priorities when the House returns in January? So uh, why don't we start with Ted, since you uh, are a Republican and we're a Republican and the Republicans. Sure, be glad to. Uh, number one, I just appreciate y'all inviting me here and for what the society does is so important. I think with the new Congress, 118th, I think what you'll see is more of a balance in the legislative body. It's never good when one party controls both sides. And we've seen the Democrats, we've seen the Republicans do that. And uh, I think we lose focus on what's really important for the nation and for our allies. I look at the uh, the JCPOA or the Paris Climate Accord. When it's lopsided on one side, you get an administration puts forward their agenda. Then the next administration, like when President Trump came in, takes us out of those, and then President Biden puts us back in. And from the perspective of our allies, it kind of leads to um, uh, confusion, I think, of where America stands. And I think that's very important that, that we put forth an agenda that Congress can agree on. And this is what the BUILD Act did. The BUILD Act was a strong bipartisan, bicameral uh, piece of legislation that'll survive a Congress. It'll set the pace where we are. The agenda that we see, um, I can I can answer this one of two ways, what I think they're going to do or what I hope they're going to do. And I hope they do not focus on uh, the oversight of going uh, and making things political. And I hope they focus on national security, on our debt, as you brought up before, because that is national security issue. Our trade relationships, I think, are imperative. And one of my mantras when I was in Congress, I felt the Foreign Affairs Committee was the most important committee in Congress, because if you have good foreign policy, you have good economic policies, you have good trade policies, and that equates to strong national security. And I just think those things are so important. And so I hope Congress focuses on those. And I know one of the things they'll focus on is the border security. Um, and again, that shouldn't be a political issue. That should be a policy. And um, our relationships with the Asia Pacific uh, in times that we're in now, uh, there's a tectonic shift in world powers that we haven't seen since World War II. And I think we really need to focus on that supply chains. And, um, you know, I look forward to the discussion. Russ. Thank you, Tom. And um, I appreciate your comments, Ted. And, you know, I want to be hopeful too. Uh, I think when Congress works best, uh, it has engagement from all parties and you get the expertise and experience and, and you know, input from local things happening, coming together. And uh, I, I like to say you walk in that house of representatives and you feel like you have the whole country in one room. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it works best, it can really address big issues. Uh, when it's at its worst, it's divided and bickering in a food fight. And so I'm going to be hopeful and I'd like to see that. There are some concerns, uh, I think, after this election. I think Democrats going into this were worried about uh, a total blowout. Uh, when I was in the House in 2010, uh, President Obama's first midterm election, uh, typically the pre a president's uh, first midterm is the worst. In 20, uh, 2010, the Democrats lost 60 seats. Um, and so uh, there's been, you know, throughout history, those kind of big losses for, you know, both, you know, presidents of both parties uh, to see the Democrats only lose nine seats to keep the Senate. Uh, I think that was a, a big historic uh, shift to be able to keep that midterm loss so small. 
Uh, so uh, I think the you know Democrats believe part of the reason is because they had gotten some major policies done, uh, you know, for the pandemic, uh, economically, uh, you know, for uh, energy and the environment. And I think that's uh, part of the reason they think they did well. And, and I think even as recently as this week, some of the Republican leaders were saying uh, they didn't do as well recruiting candidates as they could have. So I think those are some of the mixed messages coming out of the, the election. Uh, but again, I'm going to I'm going to land on the hopeful side that the House Republicans, even though they'll have a historic, historically small majority, uh, is going to make, you know, create new difficulties, but that they can focus on some things that can actually get done, uh, that can find some compromise that the Senate can buy into. And I think that would be the best case scenario. I think that's good. Good. Well, it sounds hopeful <laughs> that we will have a bipartisan uh, political process. So uh, another reason why we're, why we're having this signature policy event is to, uh, for us in the room and for our uh, followers, uh, to get a better understanding of how and uh, why Congress operates and uh, why certain legislation is passed. So, um, and a lot of us, I think, in this room are particularly interested in how the Inflation Reduction Act got passed. Uh, in its own right, and whether the consequences on uh, affecting our allies uh, were adequately taken into account. But at any rate, if I could, um, if I could focus in on the on the leadership races in each um, uh, for for each party, um, uh, uh, Russ. So how will the um, Nancy Pelosi will step down as Speaker, right? And um, how will the contenders for Pelosi, uh, Nancy Pelosi, take over? What will the new uh, leadership team mean and the, the tone of policies coming out of the um, of the Democrats uh, will they be as progressive will they be more moderate or you know how will this how will this play out it, it's a great question I'm, and I'm anxious myself to see how it plays out I, I served uh, of course with Speaker Pelosi uh, Steny Hoyer and uh, also uh, Whip Clyburn uh, again their collective experience uh, is substantial, mm -hmm. you know, their love of the institution. But I think over the years, they've also uh, recruited and and tried to enable uh, new leaders coming in behind them and to see all three kind of step down voluntarily to uh, have new leadership step up. It's, it's a real generational shift uh, that I think, frankly, um, we've been served well. And I think Speaker Pelosi will... Uh, be seen as a very uh, significant fi victory, you know, uh, figure in American history uh, for what she's done over her years of service. But uh, I'm excited about this new generation of, of leaders. They have a very diverse background. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries from New York, uh, Catherine Clark from Massachusetts, uh, Pete Aguilar from California. Again, very diverse group, uh, but I think they've been in uh, sort of secondary leadership positions. They, they've been groomed, and I think uh, they really have a great opportunity, I, I think, to bring the, a very diverse caucus together and stay on message and uh, try to stand up for, for democratic priorities and, frankly, some common sense things where there's potential compromise with Republicans, because without that, uh, nothing is going to get done in Congress. Right, right. And, um, and, and Ted, so there's been a lot of media attention on the Republican uh, leadership race and uh, with some conjecture that uh, 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 McCarthy will not be the, uh, the speaker. He won't get enough uh, votes. So how do you see this uh, uh, playing out? Will Republican, um, will moderate Republicans uh, form a big enough uh, coalition to, to keep things going here? Yeah, I think what you'll see is, you know, we already saw what happened in the November elections with the new members uh kevin mccarthy won but there was 36 dissenting votes and i think you'll see that grow um my prediction is kevin will not be the speaker i think you'll see somebody else maybe a tom cole or other person um i know there's people that are interested in that position and i think what you need to do is get away from the old as the democrats did bring somebody in new into leadership that can paint a vision of where the Congress should go. You know, we've got a two-year window. 
let's paint that picture of what we can accomplish. And we need to focus on, you know, the debt, our national security, the border, um, energy, independence, or security. Um, I know climate will be uh, a bipartisan issue. And then, you know, one of the things that is coming up is the food security, not just here in America with the price of fuel and things like that, but it's around the globe. And so the focus should be on that. And it's going to take a new leader that can pull, pull that coalition of the different um, um, right. factions together. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I'll ask one more question and we'll, 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 we'll all open the floor to uh, all our participants here. Um, and also our participants who are uh, zoomed in. So um, I'd like to look beyond America's shores and think about the trade and to think about trade and foreign policy with a special focus on uh, the Indo-Pacific region and the Republic of Korea. Uh, so um, how will the new Congress, do you think, how, how, how will it manage this uh, strategic competition with China? Of course, we have the Chips and Science Act for semiconductors, which um, uh, is attempting to manage that aspect of our competition with China. And um, and how will we coordinate with our allies? I, I think the sense, the sense here, I think, is accurate to say that the Inflation Reduction Act uh, didn't have any coordination with its effects on our allies, including the Republic of Korea. Um, and so um, how do you see this playing out? Um, Ted, you want to go first? Sure. Um on foreign affairs, you know, one of the, the talking points, and I remember Ed Royce and Elliot Engel always says politics stops at the water's edge. And this is where the Foreign Affairs Committee has always been very bipartisan in general. And I think it needs, I think it'll stay that way. I think with the leadership of Chairman McCall and uh, Gregory Meeks will probably remain, become the ranking member. Uh, they have a great working relationship and there's a lot of respect from both sides on that. Um, if you can keep politics out of that, you know, the, the political factions. Um, and I think what you'll see is there's a big push on China, not to contain them, but look at them who they are, you know, and I get asked a lot, how do you deal with China? You know, what should we do? And it's, you have to know what their end game is. And there's several books out there. Their goal is to be the world hegemon and knowing that and seeing their actions our policies are going to be directed towards that, and it should be not to suppress them, but to pivot away from them, mainly in our supply chain. And you can go down a list of things, whether it's our dependence on antibiotics from 60, 40, 40 to 100 percent on the antibiotics, our rare earth metals, our fertilizers, so many things in our supply chain are dependent on that. And what we're seeing is we're seeing capital move out of China. You know, uh, Warren Buffett with um, uh, his organization has divested from China because they see that it's just not attainable in the future. And so I think when we see more countries pivoting away from there, that pressure will be put on um, Xi Jinping. And I think they'll have to change policies eventually. Uh, the other thing is, I think they'll focus on our trade. As I said before, our trade is so important between our, our allies and uh, uh, other countries that aren't strong allies. That trade is a bond that we connect with that um, we should focus more on because that brings stability. And I was always a um, argued against the role of America, you know, in the past, say, 30, 40 years, it's been to build democracies. And I don't think that's the role of the United States government. I think our government should focus on stable governments, helping governments become stronger and stable, and then become stronger allies in that are trading partners. And then I think what you'll see is you'll see relationships get better. Um, I hope that answers the question, <laughs> if I didn't stray that's too much. <laughs> That's an interesting debate. Yeah, do we support uh, democracy or do we uh, support stable countries? Because actually, it's I think for democracy to emerge in 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 the developing countries, you need economic development first. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for democracy to be to be to be stable, we saw what happened in Tunisia. They had the first Arab democracy, but then everything fell apart because the economy was unstable after the Arab Spring. Uh, Russ, um, what what's your view on? looking yeah, the, beyond the shores of the U.S. We've had these just unprecedented, you know, challenges stacked upon each other from, you know, COVID to the economy to a ground war in Europe uh, to uh, climate change. All are global issues that no one country or small group of countries can solve. And so it's really 
I, I think for those that doubted the need for this engagement around the globe with our friends, I, I think, you know, your message, Ted, and, and I think it's been a bipartisan one. It's like America needs to be at the table for these, these big global challenges. Sure. Uh, looking out for our interest and things so that you know we can have our allies engage with us to to really make a difference. So uh, and I think domestically, uh, President Biden and the Democrats have, uh, and again the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill had uh, substantial Republican support, uh, historic uh, piece of legislation for long needed infrastructure uh, in our country, Chips and Science Act again uh, for technology so important, the IRA climate provisions. Uh, all of those have been key things in our uh, U.S. interest, uh, but also significant around the globe for, you know, standing up for those things. But it's been key to be engaged with our allies on these issues. Been key uh, global businesses uh, have also been key in this conversation. And one of the most unifying things in Congress is pushing back against China, because I think everybody sees that threat and that strategic competition uh, to be sure, especially supply chains uh, aren't captive uh, in a way that is hurts our uh, economic and right. security interests. Right. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now I'll, I'll turn over to our participants, but I'd like to give uh, 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 former trade minister, uh, Johan Gu, the opportunity uh, to, answer, to ask the first question. And thank you for uh, improvising with your schedule at the last minute and joining us today yeah. here in New York. Uh, thank you very much for having me. This is a fascinating discussion. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, you know, sharing your you know, insight uh, from, from uh, you know, your experience in Congress. I think this uh, Korea, uh, US economic and especially trade relation uh, has really evolved and then upgraded uh, from you know, this 10-year uh, uh, you know, partnership of this Korosepte, which is uh, one of the highest stand standard, you know, this modern uh, trade agreement. But recently, uh, as Congressman um, Yuho mentioned, the supply chain uh, cooperation has been really critical. Uh, imagine, um, you know, the supply chain in semiconductor, battery, EV, and then also biopharmaceutical. Um, Korea, U.S. is really indispensable to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, semiconductor, you know, Samsung, uh, they invested, you know, the, the tens of billions of dollars uh, in the state of the art, uh, the semiconductor uh, you know, facility. And also batteries, EU, EV and, you know, batteries. Uh, there's about 14 uh, new, uh, you know, manufacturing facility is being, um, you know, the man, uh, being built in the United States by 2025, but 11 out of 14. Uh, which occupying about 70% uh, of new capacity to be deployed by 2025, uh, being uh, built by Korea or Korea US joint venture. So this is really um, you know, interconnected um, and then it really win win uh, you know, relationship. Uh, but so I think we need to continue to um, you know, build on this uh, really strong uh, partnership to uh, you know, technology you know, alliance and also supply chain alliance. But it doesn't mean that our bilateral relation is perfect. I think there are obviously areas for improvement. Um, for example, um, as Tom mentioned, this Inflation um, you know, Reduction Act. I think that makes, uh, you know, allies a bit nervous, uh, you know, because, um, you know, to, to develop and strengthen the U.S. supply chain, also you need partnership with international partner, trusted partnership. That's what this friend shoring or ally shoring is about. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, there is a sort of a discriminatory you know, nature uh, of this, all these big you know, subsidies being planned by IRA. Uh, that really send a sort of wrong signal to international business community, especially in allies and partners. You know, for example, um, we very much appreciate this IRA, this the you know, historic this climate bill that the U.S. Congress has passed. Um, but uh, you know, also Korea has also this EV uh, subsidies. Uh, but we don't discriminate based on nationality. Uh, once they invest in Korea, uh, they consider as 
you know, Korean company, whether they are from US or European Union. So for example, our uh, EV subsidies, 20% uh, of the subsidies were uh, taken by American companies. So I think, you know, uh, this sort of uh, discriminatory natures of this IRA uh, needs to be fixed as soon as possible. So I hope that uh, this 118th uh, Congress uh, could put you know, this kind of uh, um, you know, issues as one of the top priority. And then really focus on uh, building you know, really strong supply chain between US and uh, strongest ally, especially you know, Korea. If I can just follow up with, um, with you, Minister Yeo. Um, yeah, so the Biden administration, I think one of the hallmarks of the Biden administration's policy has been to reach out to allies. Um, and uh, try to nurture positive relationships, and uh, particularly for you know for those countries, of course, our allies included, who follow a rules rules based international order. But yet, as Minister Yaw said, the Inflation Reduction Act, by denying national treatment to imports of, of EV cars from from Korea, it's making its own rules on 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 trade, which are I don't I don't think it, I, which I believe are inconsistent with. Both the chorus FTA as well as WTO obligations. So, how how will the the new Congress or the or the Biden administration you know remedy these frictions with the IRA and and our allies? What's maybe Ted? You could take the first sure. stab at that. Um, you know, anytime you get into a new trade agreement, there's going to be somebody that's going to have their feelings hurt. But I think what you just brought up and what you brought up are things that should be looked at more in depth before they come across and pass legislation. I think they should take that into consideration and maybe go through a gradation of implementing things and give you time to adjust. Uh, we've seen this in the past and um, it's one of those things that it, it weakens or it strains our relationship. And in today's world with what's going on with North Korea and with China, we need to have that alliance stronger than it's ever been before. And not just with South Korea, but with Japan too. And we need to make that a strong, uh, as, as strong as NATO, you know, that kind of a, uh, an alliance. And by, like I said before, the trade associations or the trade agreements that we come up with are, are so critical that we get it right and that we should have room for adjustment in those. Um, you know, I, I wasn't aware that um, the U.S. gets 20% of the EV subsidies from Korea. I also know in Korea, for you guys to allow EVs to be made here in the other plants, you have to go to your unions in Korea to get them to agree that the plan in America, if you're going to change them from, you know, gas cars to EVs, you've got to have the, the agreement of that. And I would hope our, our trade negotiators are the ones that wrote the legislation would have taken that into consideration to give you time to get the approval of that so that you could rapidly change. And I think if we look at those things like that in the future on legislation, I think those things will smooth that legislation out. I think it'll make it a stronger alliance and it'll show goodwill from our side to your side. And I think that's so important in business. Russ, how should we move forward from here? Yeah, as, as you all know, the, the Biden administration is uh, very deeply engaged in the implementation of the IRA. Uh, Treasury, Treasury Department is working on those uh, regs, and they're seeking lots of input about that. My belief is um, there's a need for balance here. Clearly, there is a high priority to uh, improve our domestic supply chain uh, and work with our allies. Uh, but the fact is, uh, we can't wrap up fast enough in minerals or processing or batteries to meet the short-term goals. And so I think there's almost a need that you, we have to do both. Uh, and I, I, I have to believe there's going to be some kind of a, at least a transitional uh, conversation on how we can do that. Because uh, we can't rely 100% on uh, uh, on you know, supplies coming from other countries, but neither can we rely 100% on, on what we have domestically. So I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to be both. Mm -hmm. The devil's in the details, but I think they're, they're certainly seeking lots of input to try to get that balance right, uh, because frankly, the whole world has sort of gone in, you know, on, on EVs, but there's been this sort of oops moment that 
hey, we don't have our supply chain right. figured out on this. Right. And so I, I think the acceleration of that, you know, the all the above approach uh, is, I think, the only only real practical answer at this point. Right, right. Okay, great. So uh, let's try to get some other opinions and questions in here. Um, if anyone and if any one of our virtual participants uh, would like to jump in and ask a question, uh, please click the raise hand button. Um, okay, so Sean, good. Congressman Yoho and Karnan, thank you very much for your service and for being here today. Uh, Congressman Yoho, pursuant to some of the security and trade issues you mentioned, since you were in office at the time, what did you think of our decision to leave TPP in 2017? And Minister Yo, when will South Korea formally submit its application? I'm still waiting. Thank you. TPP was one of those things that just was uh, Hillary Clinton said she wasn't going to support it. Donald Trump said he wasn't. And we pulled out of it. I think it could have been done better. Uh, I don't like the large multinational trade agreements. I like strong bilateral, like the core deal. I think that's the, the, the stronger you make your bilateral agreements. I think the better the trade agreement is because you don't have to appease all those different entities. Um, I know a lot of people got hurt over that. You know, I think of um, uh, Prime Minister Abe and uh, 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 President Moon. Um, they had put a lot of effort into that, and it showed um, uh, just bad form by the United States to pull out of it abruptly. But it was one of those things I think was going to be a political fight in Congress that probably wouldn't have passed in the House anyways or in the Senate or, you know, it wouldn't have been ratified by the Senate. And I think moving forward, knowing what I know now about the influence of China and how they're trying to get into the other trade, um, I, I just think it's so important that we focus on these trade policies and we've we've put in legislation to have bilateral trade agreements with pretty much outside of ASEAN, but also bilateral with each ASEAN nation. Um, and and uh, I think that's a better way to go. I just think it's, it's easier to negotiate. And um, that's what I'd like to see them do. And I think they need to do it sooner than later to counter what China is doing as we talked about the supply chain. Um, you know, you can't build a EV market if you don't have control of lithium. And China controls the majority of that, along with rare earth metals. <laughs> yes, I think that you know CPT, CPTPP uh, is is very important. The regional you know architecture for this uh, trade and investment uh, regime, and uh, I think many countries in the region uh, want the United States to come back to CPTPP. Not now, but you know at some point in time. And uh, if United States were in CPTPP, then I think you know it could really help accelerate you know Korea's uh, accession uh, to CPTPP. But now um, you know there's a this Indo-Pacific economic framework that the Biden administration is really rolling out, and uh, you know despite many different opinions on this IPEP, I believe that um, you know IPEP is really could be a unique framework to tackle all these newly emerging um, you know, trade issues. As we mentioned, uh, the supply chain and uh, climate change decarbonization and also digital trade. So I think Korea and United States have this 10 year experience of implementing a very high level of this uh, standard and rules. So I think um, you know, building on this uh, Korea-US uh, chorus FTA experience, I think uh, you know, our two countries could play a constructive, constructive role uh, in developing this new kind of uh, the architecture to deal with all these new issues that we are talking about. But then, I mean, to make this durable, don't we need to get um, any new trade arrangement, including IPEF, uh, rooted in congressional legislation? It's going to, well, on the, on the congressional side, you have to do the, um, um, uh, what's the, is it FTA? Pre, um, the, yeah, that's TPA. You have to approve that, and then the, it goes over to the Senate. Uh, but you have to have the support of both sides, or it's not going to move. And I think if it's uh, written right and presented properly, it will move. But the policy should be on what's best for America's foreign policy long term. Uh, instead of just looking the vision in, a, in in Congress, what I saw is 
on the Republican side is two years. No, actually, it's September 30th when a new Congress starts, and that's when they fund the government. Our our vision should be longer than that in the House, and that's why I think you'll see new leadership in there. Right. Right. Russ, you're nodding your head. You're I'm, just, I'm agreeing. Okay. <laughs> I'm seeing bipartisan agreement. <laughs> Good. It's refreshing to have bipartisan uh, opinions here, agreements. Um, yeah, Jonathan. Is there more that Congress can do through legislation to reassure our East Asian allies about the long-term commitment of the United States to East Asian security and to our defense agreements with those states? At the moment, it seems to be fairly stable, but just based on the previous administration statements and some members of Congress, admittedly extreme members, um, more recent statements as well. Sure. You want me to go? Sure. I think there are several things we can do. If you look at the course deal, President Trump was going to pull out of that. I was in Korea on a Friday, and they said, President Trump's pulling out a chorus. I assured them, no, they're not. I'm with the Korean delegation. Saturday, I'm on the plane, and it's in the paper that we pulled out of it. And I, I wrote a, 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 a very nice letter to the president and asked him to respectfully stay in it for these reasons. Number one, they're our sixth largest trading partner. And if you look where Korea came from, and the amount of economic development they've made in a short period of time. They're our sixth largest trading partner, one of our largest agricultural uh, trading partners. If we pull out of that, Korea has no choice but to move closer to China, which empowers them economically and militarily. But it's not just Korea. It's the ASEAN bloc of nations, which is six, what, 653 million people, $4 trillion close to trade. They're going to look at how we treat our sixth largest trading partner. And they're like, we need to get closer to China because we have no hope with America. And so for that, I asked him to respectfully stay in there. I got invited to the White House. So I won't bore you with that. Um, but he asked my opinion and I, I gave it to him. Uh, but there was a Korean delegation. I don't know if you were in that. They came over to my office after I got back from the from Korea. <laughs> and they said, oh, they're all up in arms about the Korea trade. <laughs> and so I gave him the letter I sent to President Trump. So they all had that. And then they met with President Trump. And I think that's what prompted me to, to be able to go to the White House for a very kind of exclusive level lunch. Um, but it's just, that's one thing we can do is things like that. Um, the other thing is, how do you counter China with their aggression? We don't want a kinetic fight. I mean, we've been to wars and wars are terrible, you know, a lot of damage. And the end result is you become trading partners. We've seen that in World War I, World War II, uh, the Vietnam War. So let's bypass the war. And I implored the ASEAN bloc of nations to come together as a bloc and to say, we don't agree with what China's doing. And if we have policies that support that, and we can do that by having the president show up at the ASEAN meetings regularly, instead of having these large breaks in between that and talk about the importance of that. And then with the trade deal that you were talking about, I think that's something that really needs to be focused on. Um, I think the worst thing we can do is be in the Paris Climate Accord, get out, get back in, because it just creates confusion where America stands. And I think we need to stop that. Um, and I think we just need to be strong in where we stand and have a very clear policy. And if we do that, I think I think our relationships will be stronger, but I think the world will be safer. Yeah, I mean, there's there's real value in consistency. And even if, you know, the party, you know, leadership changes in Congress or the White House, you know, having the sort of basic consistency in our policies, reassurance to our allies that we're going to be there and, and that we have way more common interests than we have differences and, and work through those. And I think just being there at the table, looking at those common interests, that's a powerful thing. <laughs> Uh, when you have those allies working together on these big global challenges, and when we do that well, uh, you know, everybody at the table is, is generally is going to benefit. And so I think that that approach and that mindset uh, is really important uh, with our leaders in Congress and folks in the administration. Can I add one more thing to that? Of course. <laughs> one of the other things, and this is something, a policy paper that we wrote in our office is manufacture the ABC method. 
and that's manufacturer anywhere but China. I would get the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is coming in complaining about how China is stealing their intellectual property. You've got to turn over a certain percentage of your business. You've got to have a CCP member on your board. And they come to us and complain. I says, why are you in China? And they said, well, it's a 1.3 or 4 billion person market. I said, it is. It's huge. I said, but look over here. There's 6 billion people over here. Stop worrying about them. They're stealing your stuff. Focus over here. Move your supply chains out of China. And we started talking about that about six years ago. And I'm happy to see like Warren Buffett moving out. Some of these large apples just announced they're moving out of China. If we take that economic pressure or that machine that gives them the money and move it out, I think that pressure will get the proletariat to reconsider what their policy should be in a peaceful way. Uh, okay, so we'll let our uh, Jonathan go ahead, our Greek Society's policy director. Thanks so much for all your comments. I, I wanted to ask about the tension between onshoring versus friendshoring, which is something that's coming up a lot and uh, has a lot of relevance for these critical partnerships that we're trying to pursue and present America as a place where our relationships are based on rules and values, unlike relationships with China, where they are subject to coercion. And yet there's some, I think, fair argument from some of our friendly partner countries saying that America is putting a lot of pressure on them to move all their supply chains into America and base it there. So the alternative to onshoring is friendshoring, where you spread your supply chains to your friends and allies. And this is for critical things like EVs and chips, et cetera. Yeah. So how can we pursue this in a balanced way that secures our interests, but also communicates that America is going to be that values-based partner in a way that China can never be? They can never be that. I mean, take uh, take the DRC, for example. Um, you know, one of the largest, uh, you know, deposits in, in supply for uh, critical minerals, uh, largely controlled by China. Uh, the Congo, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, mm. but there's opportunity, even there, where uh, a lot of leaders there will tell you, they're frustrated. They don't like doing business with China. They, they like alternatives to having to do business with China. And the administration has sent many high-level delegations there uh, to talk about how to begin to peel some of that off and, and open those doors up. And so part of what I think we have to do better is show up, have to give China some credit. They've been showing up to a lot of these places to engage and, and you know get roots put in. Uh, to their advantage, but uh, we have to show up and and be that alternative and, and a better alternative. And so even in a tough place like that, um, I think there's opportunity and we can do it there, certainly in, you know, other friendly allies, you know, that were, there's been a lot of outreach, uh, Australia, Canada, you just look around the globe where there's been uh, really uh, deep engagement on these issues. And certainly Korea uh, has been on this on this list engagement and trying to solve these big problems. And so uh, that there's real opportunity there when you do that. No, you're absolutely right. I, I've been to three African summits here in the last six months. There's another one going to be in D.C. <laughs> next week. And we were talking with two of the pre ex-presidents from one was from the Congo, one was from uh, Ghana. And um they said when America comes with foreign policy or foreign assistance, they've got a checklist. And depending on what party's in control, this checklist is a little bit smaller here. If there's other parties in control, it's longer. He goes, and we look at that, it becomes very cumbersome. And here's China and Russia says, here's your money. And we don't, and this is what they said, we don't want to do business with them but it's a heck of a lot easier. So I think we need to streamline our process. Mm -hmm. I think we should focus on <clears throat> building that infrastructure. And you can hear any debate on why the immigrants are coming into America from uh, Central and South America or, and elsewhere. And it's because we haven't done enough in economic development. I disagree with that. We have spent billions and billions of dollars in economic development, but I don't think we're focusing on the right thing. You know, rule of law, uh, corruption and all those things 
I mean, we could focus on that here as much as anywhere else sometimes, but I think we should focus on, and this is what the DFC was so good with, is we can partner up with other DFCs, we can partner up with private equity, and we can do significant infrastructure projects in an area, and we can also do regional that will bring in the investment dollars that'll create the jobs in those areas. And we know that our system is better and that people will eventually move to our our, our beliefs and value system is it, it's not going to happen overnight. Heck, it's taken us over 200 years to get where we're at. And we're still, we're still not right. <laughs> so is the, um, Ted is the, the build acts, uh, development finance corporation. Is it, is it making any traction? I mean, it's fairly new. Um, you know, well, did, did, did it offer one. anything to Ghana and to, uh, to Congo? Yeah. There Africa's got a big portfolio. There's in 2022, there was over, yeah, this year, I think there's over $7.2 billion that have been given out. Uh, it's supposed to go to developing countries and medium income countries. And, uh, we met with, um, uh, the administrator of the DFC and Samantha powers of USAID, and we're trying to get them to focus on the mission of the of the agency right. not to let it grow outside of that because if it stays specific we can partner with korea we can partner with japan or any of the other dfcs and by doing that it brings us to the table together which creates a stronger relationship but it also is more impactful in that area and together we can have a strong counter to the bri as you brought up um what we have seen around the world, whether it's Central America, South America, Africa, or elsewhere, China comes in, they bring their workers, they bring their material, they build Chinese restaurants, Chinese hotels, and they develop a Chinese economy in that country and exploit the minerals or whatever product they're taking. And there's a lot of resentment from that. Um, unfortunately, you have some despotic leaders that get very wealthy and they like that system. And it's just, they're not serving their people. Right. Can I? Yeah, please. Yeah, can in. I? Add, um, yeah. I absolutely agree with this, um, the importance of diversification and also the importance of building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, just, just concentrating on these critical materials, the supply of critical materials on one or two countries could be a very, very volatile, you know, put yourself sure. in a very, very vulnerable position. And uh, so uh, diversifying those uh, critical raw material sources are important, but when I talk with these business leaders in any countries, especially um, in the Asia Pacific region, um, what they are saying is that so they want to really ramp up, you know, very rapidly, but uh, there's a lack of infrastructure, you know. Sure. So how could we develop some sort of a coordinated mechanism among like-minded countries and allies to uh, really ramp up and uh, you know prioritize? is uh, development financing or ODA, you know, funding uh, towards this, uh, you know, key area. So I think uh, in that sense, uh, this IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, could play an important role. Um, there are two parts. One is developing rule, rulemaking uh, in digital trade and also this critical, you know, the decarbonization, um, you know, the supply chain. Rulemaking is one thing, but also there could be very substantive uh, the cooperation element. So through this uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, this you know, like-minded country could develop some sort of coordinated mechanism to really accelerate and then coordinate uh, this uh, developing funding uh, to for, for this uh, infrastructure in this uh, you know, critical raw material development and also digital trade. I think that could really uh, you know, change the game in the region. Yeah, I mean, they're just an example of that, the, the administration's critical minerals partnership, where they're bringing together multiple countries uh, to look at critical minerals. And so things are a lot of that collaborative type approach, uh, but also historic uh, public sector investments, but also partnering with the private sector, you know, the, to accelerate these technologies and in, in the capacity. And so I think that's, uh, in terms of that capacity building, you're exactly right to have those not only the you know key allies brought together, but that public-private sector engagement where you're getting the best of both worlds, and uh, that to me is the most powerful way to get this to happen faster and better, and to have uh, more of these countries uh, benefit. 
Well, would this argue for more um, free trade agreements with African countries? As difficult as that that may be, I don't. I don't know. Korea is is like one of the global leaders in free trade bilateral free trade agreements. I don't know if you have any free trade agreements with the Central Republic of Congo or I mean no, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. We don't. Any yeah, we don't. Countries. Yeah, we don't have. We have we, our the you know, FTA network covers about eighty five percent of global GDP, but. Uh, we haven't really set foot yet in the African continent. And uh, uh, the last year, we first kind of uh, signed on to begin uh, this joint study on developing uh, FTA with Egypt. Yeah, so that's the kind of first of uh, its kind uh, with African country. The, the prediction we heard was that Africa right now accounts for about 2% of the GDP, world GDP. By 2050, they're talking that it will be close to 20%. So there's going to be rapid growth over there. And it's one of those things that if we partner up, knowing that a lot of those countries don't care for the assistance they're getting from those other two countries, if we know that, we can partner up bilaterally. We can bring in private equity. And that's something <clears throat> the OPEC couldn't do, but we can partner with private equity we take an equity stake, but the United States doesn't want to keep that. We sell that. But if we do that, you think of the amount of money we can bring in that can change a region, you know, whether it's mining, whether it's tourism, whether it's, um, you know, energy, uh, whatever it is, we can do that. And that would help move that supply chain because right now, you know, depending on the rare earth minerals, we're 100 percent dependent on some of those from China. And just in our F-35, I've been told that there's thousands of pounds of rare earth minerals. So if we're dependent on somebody that's a potential adversary, I think it would behoove us as Americans to move that supply chain as quickly as we can to like-minded countries or partner up with somebody like you to do that in another country. Right, right. Offshore, you know, it doesn't have to be onshore. And that's why I said anywhere but China, you know, and we we can do that. Um, until until the rise of China, uh, uh, and, and China's intentions of being a hegemon, ABC had another uh, acronym here in American uh, politics, but we'll go ahead and skip that. Uh, Kevin, did you have a question? I did, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation, Congressman Minister. Thank you for having this. Um, Congressman Miho, I was very uh, glad to hear you mention food insecurity. Yeah. I'm curious if you could just say a little bit more about how you uh, see that playing into this all the things we've been talking about and what our role is. Oh, I mean, we can lead on that. And we have been around the world when you look at that, and you know, especially when you see the EU polling back or Great Britain polling back on their assistant dollars for food security. If you have food insecurity in a nation, you don't have security in your nation, you know, because people are going to do whatever they can to feed themselves and their family. In an America, um, Samantha Powers just, I mean, I got so much respect for her. She did a, a, an ask of the NGOs and corporations to raise $100 million, and they did it rather quickly. And so she says, if we can do that $100 million, let's do another $100 million. So they raised $200 million. And uh, the second hundred million was in with was in eight weeks, and these private organizations and philanthropy com companies have come to the table, like the Gates and um, Eleanor Crook Foundation, things like that. But in addition, the United States government, I think, has put two hundred ninety million dollars into the Food Security Act, mm -hmm. which I think just passed. I think Mike McCall led that, and President uh, Biden signed that into law, and um, he said he was very proud that President. Uh, Biden signed that into law. That's something we're very aware of. And um, when you look at the RUTFs, the ready to use therapeutic foods, you know, those are coming from America. I mean, France has them, but the majority of them are coming from America. And their emphasis through USAID and the United States government is that we diversify that so that we're not dependent on two manufacturers in America. And that's something that we're very focused on. And at the Kyle House Group, we put a big emphasis on that. And we work with that. Hear your passion. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, do we have any other questions from our virtual audience or in-person audience? Uh, Fumiko. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insight. And I'm very uh, happy to know that you you really understand what you, America needs. And I just wonder what happened to the build, uh, build, build Back Better World version that, right, that is pr partly... Uh, proposed to be an alternative to Belt and Road Initiative. And I studied a Belt and Road Initiative and I 
what I found as a problem is not so much about that uh, um, uh, ideas, but more about uh, if America leaves everything to the, uh, the free market, no one wants to go to Africa while Chinese people are willing to go there, right? So when I went to uh, the Ethiopia, so many Chinese people excited to go to some African countries, but I wonder whether American people would, would do that, right? So uh, most of the people who are studying the Belt and Road Initiative say the same thing, that whether American companies are willing to go to the really, really rough environment in Africa or Asia, India. And I think that that is a, a part of the problems I found in terms of the competition between China and the, uh, the US in the developing countries. And so uh, could you tell me what, what happened to the Build Back Better World, that version? No one talks about that anymore. So yes, thank you. I'll defer to Russ. <laughs> yeah, so build, build Back Better was a great uh, campaign slogan. Uh, I think it uh, encapsulated a lot of the ideas that President Biden took to the campaign uh, to sort of uh, put a headline on uh, a big package of ideas. Mm -hmm. But uh, a large majority of the components that were in Build Back Better have been in the bipartisan infrastructure law and other of these major acts that have passed I mean, historic things that have passed. I mean, things the Congress has been working on a major national infrastructure package for a very long time uh, that has had, bi frankly, bipartisan support. Uh, but it it got to the finish line. So, uh, just very pleased to see that happen. I think it's going to have a lot of impact uh, in terms of building up our critical infrastructure. And so, uh, I think the again beyond the slogan. Uh, the things that have actually been in, in these bills that passed uh, have been, you know, largely came through that, uh, you know, those big ideas from Build Back Better of sort of what do we need to build the basic infrastructure, you know, our, our science and, you know, critical infrastructure, energy infrastructure to address climate, all those things have been part of these big pieces of legislation that I think we're gonna see over the next several years really have a big impact. Uh, and, and, and just, um, you know, compared to what China is doing again, as we talked about, you know, when, when the US shows up, uh, I mean, whether we're looking at, you know, healthcare initiatives, uh, climate, food, um, energy, there's, we have major uh, initiatives in Africa. Uh, from the from the public sector, private sector, from NGOs, and so I think there's there's still a strong appetite and interest, uh, you know, to be good neighbors, uh, to show up and and help build those economies because if we're building those relationships and they're succeeding, they're going to be future trading partners and allies, and so to me that just all works together. Yeah, I, I kind of differ than Russ on on the build back better. You know, I think, as you said, it, there's a lot of campaign slogans in there. And I don't think policy should be built on those kind of slogans. I think policy direction should come from an administration, but I would hope it it would live beyond an administration to give that that security uh, to our allies. And then I think the legislation should follow what that policy is for America. And the U.S. should take into consideration of what we've talked about on this table, especially when you look at Africa, there is not a large presence of, you know, America or Korean um, um, investment there, but there needs to be. And I think if we have policies like, what are we gonna do to help Amer uh, Africa get to that 20% in the next 25 to 30 years, if we strategize from ourselves, but bring in allies and other countries that wanna help that, for the benefit of Africa, not so much for the benefit of, of us, but if we help them come along, their quality of life will go up. And I think the world will be a lot safer place, you know, and I think that's so important that we do that. Agree with you there. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a, a final wrap up question, but before I get to that, I'd like to um, to ask Minister Yaw if you have any any comment to conclude on or, or mm -hmm. question. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with the Congressman you know, Teho about the potential of Africa. Uh, in fact, uh, the last month I visited the three African countries, Namibia, 
and uh, Zambia and Burundi. And uh, they clearly understood the potential of this, the, the, the vast, uh, the, you know, the, the, the vast, uh, the, the mineral sources they have. Uh, and, uh, you know, surprisingly this IT revolution uh, really changed their life. So everybody has mobile phone right now, but they cannot charge the mobile right, phone right. because of the lack of electricity. So they walk, you know, miles and miles to find mm -hmm. electricity to, you know, energy, uh, the, recharge their battery. So uh, they were clearly un well understood, uh, understanding the importance of energy, you know, supply of energy and especially the green energy. So they were showing interest in hydrogen power and then all these renewable, you know, solar, the wind, etc. So I think there's really great potential, but they need help. You know, they don't have infrastructure and then, you know, there's a lot to do, you know, also the policy support. So how could the United States lead, you know, the, in collaboration with other allies and like-minded countries to really, um, you know, jumpstart this kind of big potential in Africa. So I think, you know, I, I wanted to emphasize that point. I think a neat thing for Africa is they're not burdened by old infrastructure. You look around here and you look at the decaying buildings or the subway that's over 100 years old or Flint, Michigan with the lead pipes and all that. Africa doesn't have to deal with that. They can build smart cities starting today. And it's going to take leadership from around this table and around the world of coming together, meeting with the African leaders in that country and say, what do you want? What is going to be most beneficial for future generations. And if you can get a buy-in from a, a leader in that area, you can't fix every country in Africa today, but if you get success in one, that success breeds success to other nations. Good. Well, um, I, I think I, I'd like to close up with this question <laughs> coming from my background. So, um, I mean, any effective US government policy response to the issues we talk to really depends on a sound federal budget. <laughs> so the... Uh, <laughs> The, the, we have a $24 trillion elephant in this, this room here. That's the United States, and that's a federal government debt, which is about equal to U.S. GDP. Um, so uh, I remember working on, on the U.S. Uh, some years ago when the fiscal situation and the debt situation was much healthier, uh, talking to a senior Treasury official and asking, you know, where does, where does, where does a long-term fiscal policy come from? And he kind of laughed. He said, you have to realize, Tom, there's no U.S. government doesn't have uh, fiscal policy, it just has fiscal outcomes. Exactly. So uh, when will the U.S. Uh, get its own house in order? Uh, what, how, do you, how do you see a policy, policy priority for having a, a, a long-term fiscal policy so that the U.S. can deal with all these issues, important issues? Take that first. Sure, I'll take uh, the, I mean, I, I would point to the specific uh, policies that were uh, passed here recently that set some minimum tax rates for biggest companies so that they're not paying zero taxes and uh, for a high in, high income individuals over making over $400,000 also paying a fair share and the, the that is helping pay for some of these big initiatives but including uh, paying down what we owe and so to me that's one of the one of the biggest uh, concrete steps that have taken to get our economic house in order. And over the next few years, uh, there, there's an ability to see that continue to come down, but you had to have a pay for, uh, and that was a very pragmatic uh, pay for that, uh, you know, did not appear to be harming our economy. And that is, is, a, is a reasonable way to begin to, to take, to address that. So that to me, that's a, been a very concrete uh, outcome. Uh, from these major pieces of legislation. Okay, good. That's encouraging us. I think we need government reform. It's not that we don't have enough money. It's we spend too much is my my take from where I come from. In 1988, the United States debt was $2.5 trillion. When I came into Congress, it was $13.5 trillion. When I left Congress, I failed miserably because it was put right at $29 trillion. And I went up there to help get our debt under control. It's unsustainable. If you look at, and that was when interest rates were low. And if you look at the pie chart of discretionary versus mandatory in the 60s, the discretionary was about 70% of our expenditures. 
our mandatory is about 30% or the difference. Today, it's the inverse of that. And the mandatory is going up uh, because of our social programs, retirement programs that we have. And if you look at our interest rate five years ago, it was attainable to go ahead and service our debt. Today, the interest on our debt is equivalent to what we're spending for national or for our, our military. And we can't go on this way. There has to be reforms. And I think there's some things that should be sent back to the states. Uh, being on the Ag Committee, one of the big things were food stamps. We have a federal program that controls the food stamps, yet we know there's a lot of fraud in that. I was on food stamps when we first got married. I got laid off and we were on it for six weeks and I was really thankful it was there. But that program has grown so large that when we did an analysis with the USDA, they admitted there was a billion dollars in fraud. But they said more likely four to seven billion. And I'm not picking on that program. That's just a government program. We try to reform SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. Our program would have saved $18 billion, $18 billion I think it was a year. I think it was $180 billion over 10 years. Um, I might be off by a B or an M, <laughs> but I think it was in the billions and there were just silly reforms that we could have done and it should have been a bipartisan, but members on my side would not touch it because, oh, if, if I go look, if I do that, it looks like I'm cutting benefits and the election's coming up. And I think we should get people to focus on where the country's going to be, you know, in 10 years, um, because if we're financially broke, we don't have national security and other people know that. Good. Okay. Well, we do live in a complicated world and the 18th Congress has a lot on its plate and hopefully they can take a long uh, term view and address these issues that we talked about today. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, here at the Career Society. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, new and solid infrastructure building. Uh, this is not a crumbling building. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and thank you all, uh, who, uh, who, who, who dialed in and are, are watching. So thanks, um, Thank uh, uh, Congressman Yoho and Congressman uh, Carnahan. Thank you. Thank you.